When it comes to health and wellness, good sleep is essential. Ashley invites you to a new era of sleep with the latest in sleep technologies. Experience all-night cooling with the Tempur-Pedic Breeze Collection or rest easy with adaptive pressure relief on the all-new Purple Collection thanks to its Gel Flex Grid. Don't lose sleep over choosing a new mattress. Your perfect fit is here at Ashley. Shop online or visit an Ashley store today. Better sleep starts here. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man with a reminder that you're not the only ship adrift on this ocean. Here is the captain. I can't even find my ship. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today, we are still sipping on some Red Bird Ale from Portsmouth Brewing Company. Red Bird Ale is an all-American home-run beer named for the Portsmouth, Ohio minor league baseball team of 1939. It's labeled as a California steam ale brewed with roasted caramel malts. ABV 4.8%, garage grade 3 and a quarter, bottle caps out of 5. And let's give some thanks and praise to our good friends for helping us fill up the fridge this week. First up, we have Desiree from Cincinnati. And we also have Jennifer Moss and her son, Mason, listening to TCG together in beautiful parts unknown. Thank you to everyone who went to truecrimegarage.com and contributed to this week's beer fund. Yeah, BWWR, you win beer run. You want to support the show and get something in return, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the store page and pick you up a t-shirt. And that's enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Dispatch article from 2005 on the anniversary of the disappearance of Rob Boney titled Police Still Searching for Man Gone Nine Years. This is on the nine-year anniversary, Captain, and the article states Rob Boney backed his red Pontiac Firebird out of his driveway and disappeared down the two-lane road. This according to a neighbor working in her yard on Central College Road on that hot July evening. She saw him go, as she said she had seen many times before, said that it seemed routine. But as we know, Captain, unfortunately, that was the last time anyone reported seeing Rob alive. Now, fast forward all of these years later. Today is the day after the anniversary of the day he was reported missing. Way back in 1996, he was reported July 18th as missing. Uh And as, and even though his body hasn't been found in this article, Westerville police detective, Dave King said he is convinced that Rob has been murdered, but they do not know how. And back in 2005, they released investigative files on the case that showed that police suspected foul play early on in this case. Why would that be? Again, this man goes missing. And what we learn here is we talked so much yesterday about his red Pontiac Firebird. What this article makes clear is that when they found that vehicle and because he was missing when they found the vehicle, they called in 
Westerville police called in Columbus police and the Ohio Bureau of Investigation. They come in and they take fingerprints. They're looking for fingerprints on different parts of this vehicle. They come to the conclusion, based off of not finding fingerprints, that it seems that the car had been wiped clean of fingerprints. And I'm guessing here, Captain, if you're sitting in a room full of detectives, we're all going, what? This guy probably didn't drive his vehicle to Hoover Reservoir over by the dam, park it, leave the keys in it, wipe down all the fingerprints from the car, and then walk away from his life. So somebody caused this man to go missing, and somebody is responsible for why he's missing and where he is today. In fact, I firmly believe, and I think that there's a lot of evidence that suggests that this case is only the recovery of his body away from bringing forward charges. Again, we stated yesterday, police had already honed in on a suspect and referred to this person as he is the suspect in this case. So a male is the prime suspect in this case. Well, and what you were saying yesterday is he leaves his house, but we have no sign of any kind of struggle or anything going down at his house. We see his car, no sign of a struggle. So at first you're just going, where did this guy go? Was he meeting up with somebody? What's the issue? But then once you start investigating a little further and you go, we can't even find anything. A single f- fingerprint. Right. That's that's very fishy. Very fishy. The other thing that people thought to be a little strange as well is there are two different reports. Rob's listed at five foot ten inches tall or five foot eleven inches tall, depending on which report you see. And several people have pointed out that when the vehicle was found, the driver's seat was pushed all the way forward closest to in the position closest to the steering wheel. People that know him best say that Rob would have never sat that close to the steering wheel. These people, it's their belief that whoever moved that vehicle was shorter than Rob and that that might be a telling sign of who put the vehicle there. And then let's take that a step further. It does not take a very big leap to go from, well, whoever placed that vehicle at Hoover Reservoir either is responsible for why Rob disappeared or knows what happened to him because assisted in moving that vehicle. I spoke to the detective and a couple things that that we agreed on. I asked him, "Is there? do you think there's any way that Rob is in Hoover Reservoir, in the water over there? Because that would make a lot of sense, right? His vehicle's found there. We're talking about five square miles of of water. Right. And, of course, the detective said, look, until we find him, nothing is 100%. I said, but would you agree, based off of the searches early on, the dive team, the, the teams that dragged the, the water over there, would you agree that the statement is of the Westerville police that we are very confident that he is not in the water? And the detective said, yes, we, our department, based off of our searches, are very confident that he is not in that water over there. Okay, so we're learning that there's no fingerprints in the vehicle. Again, the, like you said, the obvious answer is he goes missing. Is he in this water? And, and cops, for whatever reason, law enforcement, for whatever reason, is saying, no, no, we don't think he's there. We I, I, they're basing that off of their extensive searches of the that water. Yeah. What what more can we learn from this? Well, some of this is a little repetitive, but bear with me, everybody. Oh, you you're kind of like a uh, <laughs> parrot. There you go. Mm. Uh, this is the article that states that we talked about the half-eaten steak dinner. We talked about what is not public knowledge of the the Kool Aid placed in the freezer that night. His roommate being at work, that is confirmed by by all parties involved in this investigation. And you're not misspeaking. It's freezer, not refrigerator. That's that's what I was told by more than one person. Okay. And then on top of that, this is the article that states Rob left his wallet filled with money at his home. 
And this is coming from police in this article saying that that is further evidence that he wasn't planning on being away long. So we're trying to go back to figuring out why he even left at all. This article too, police saying, we don't believe he was ever put in the Hoover, end quote. This is sad. This is a sad part of the article where his mother had turned to psychics for answers for years. And it was only through the counsel of close friends, some of them being Rob's friends that had told her, kept telling her, look, these psychics are just using you. They're giving you false hope that you're going to find your son and that he's going to be alive. She's clinging on to hope. She's desperate. And so she's hiring, hiring psychics to talk with her. I mean, he's 29 years old, but this is still her baby. That's right. And she says that. And then she says also in this article that, that eventually she stopped spending money on psychics when she kind of saw the light, right? One of them tells her that his body was close to water near an outlet mall and churches. And then she realized, yeah, that's pretty easy to state that because that could be anywhere. Yeah. Or (laughs) he, did some digging. I mean, this is this is where Sunbury Road or that uh, Sunbury that that area. That's well, his car would have been around. This this is where we get the best information yet. The article goes on to say that Westerville police had solid reports early on that he was that Rob was the victim of foul play. Rob was dating a woman who had once dated a friend upsetting the man now let's use this term friend very loosely and i'll we'll get into that in just a second the article says that just before rob vanished the man might have forced rob's firebird off of route 161 in retaliation for rob dating this woman now this article refers to this woman as rob's girlfriend So it says Rob's girlfriend told Westerville police that she had talked by phone with him at about 8 p.m. July 16th. This is the last day that he's seen. And according to remember, we have the neighbor witness. So this air quotes girlfriend, as they refer to this woman in the article, says that she talked to Rob at about 8 p.m. July 16th. One hour later, he pulled out of his driveway. So that's the neighbor witnessing him pull out of the driveway around 9 p.m. And we know that the vehicle, his vehicle is found 0.3 miles from his home, opposite direction that he travels less than five hours later. That's when it, it could have been there much sooner, but we know based off of the security logs from the park ranger that it was spotted shortly after midnight. So we're starting to see a little bit of a picture here, right? Now, here is where this running Rob off the road comes into question. As well, this article says might have run him off the road. I spoke with two people that said 100% not only was Rob run off the vehicle, Rob and his vehicle run off the road on a Friday night before he disappeared, but that Rob knew the man that ran him off the road. So you rem- do you remember Captain the Billiard Club on 161? They they host bands there often. They got a bunch of pool tables. Yeah, kind of a bigger club. It was it was very popular in the 90s. Well, in the late 90s, Rob his roommate and a bunch of people in Rob's circle, a bunch of the people that Rob went to high school with. They're from Westerville. This club is in Columbus proper, but not far from Westerville. And a lot of the, the Westerville people that were of Rob's age would hang out at the billiard club in the late nineties, early, sorry, the mid to late nineties, because they knew the owner. They went to high school with the owner. On a Friday night before Rob went missing, this is very, some reports say that it was the week before he went missing. Other reports say that it was the Friday before he went missing. It's hard for me to sort that out over 20 years later. The story is this. He's talking to a girl, a woman that he knew that's roughly his age at the billiard club on that Friday night. 
Right. Let's call her Shirley. Okay. Don't call me Shirley. That's right. Shirley leaves with Rob. And we know this because Rob's there with m- several of his friends who have all told me the same story. In fact, one of those friends was with Rob at the billiard club and was in his own vehicle and would be meeting Rob and other friends at Rob's house after departing the billiard club. So Rob talks to this woman, Shirley, Rob and Shirley leave in his firebird. They're driving toward Rob's home on central college road. And the guy that she was either in a relationship with or previously in a relationship with, let's call him Andy. He spots the two. He's aware that the two are hanging out. This drives him crazy. And he decides to force Rob's car off of the road. Now, look, there's no damage done. Nobody was injured. Some would say no harm, no foul. But let's keep in mind, this is a violent act. Yeah. Somebody could have been hurt, severely hurt or injured in this situation or possibly worse. We have a whole bunch of people telling police the same name. Who would want to hurt Rob? The same name keeps coming up over and over and over and over again. Well, it's not too big of a leap to go. The guy that ran him off the road just days before is probably the same guy's name that keeps coming up to police. The friend meets Rob and Shirley back at Rob's place that night after he's run off the road. Remember, the friend was at the billiard club prior. When he gets to Rob's house, he didn't witness Rob being ran off the road. What he witnesses is he shows up at Rob's house and remember Rob's living for the weekend, work hard, party hard, bunch of people, roommate, everybody at the house. And what are they talking about? That Andy guy ran Rob off the road. Oh, he just ran him off the road. He could have killed him. That is the topic of discussion that night that they hang out. Now, listen to this article. What did they say here? They referred to this woman as Rob's girlfriend, which I think is difficult to say because we're talking days. They, they would have, if, if they were dating at all, this started days before he went missing. I think they're just calling her that because they, they didn't want to use her name. We're calling her Shirley. So she tells Westerville police that she talked to Rob on the phone at 8 PM on July 16th. Then the neighbors see him leaving in his car by himself about an hour later. His car is found less than five hours later, abandoned at Hoover Reservoir. 100% captain, whatever caused him to leave the house that night led to his disappearance. And police are saying that he was murdered. Now, this man is not unknown to police. This article could article continues. The man took a lie detector test, but results were inconclusive. Uh, how do you feel about that? Captain, do you feel like sometimes police are telling us results are inconclusive when they can't throw the guy directly under the bus publicly or to the newspapers? (laughs) Well, that's them throwing him under the bus. Yeah. Let's let people speculate, uh, as to what, what this man may have said. So here, here, here's what I wonder though. So are we saying that the night that he goes missing, that maybe he gets a call from somebody in there saying, hey, you know that guy that ran you off the road? He He's here. Or I saw him there. Mm-hmm. And so that Rob would have ran out of the house to maybe then confront this guy? The problem becomes that the neighbors don't see anybody but Rob. Right? They see Rob hop in his car and leave. I'm going to, when we get to the theories here, I, this, the breakdown of that timeline, according to the person, Shirley, that they refer to as Rob's girlfriend is very telling to me. Now, real quick, before we get to the theories, this woman that they're referring to as Rob's girlfriend says that a week later, a week after Rob disappeared, that she is at a place called Hammer Jack's bar on route 161. And I do not recall Hammer Jacks ever. I don't know where it is, where it was. It's not around today. Right. Uh, in 1996, I was not of drinking age or close to it. So if this 
you know, wherever this bar was, but it's on 161, so not terribly far from the previous club that we talked about. And this is the same woman, Shirley, says that she's at Hammer Jack's Bar on Route 161, and she runs into what is referred to as another man. So this is, when they say another man, they're clearly pointing out that it's not the same man as the suspect, right? This is another person. And the article says she ran into another man who ran with Rob's Westerville crowd. That man tells her, your boy is six feet under. Quote, your boy is six feet under. Now, police say we interviewed that man who then denied making that statement. And the police go on in this article to say that they are optimistic that somebody out there knows something. And this is nine years after the fact. They say, I hope one day that they are going to do the right thing by this family. And they do say in this article that they are confident that they could solve the case at some point, given the right information. Now, before we get into the theories, Captain, we should state Rob is listed on NamUs on the NamUs website. He is missing persons identification number MP1123. So much more to get to. Join us back here in the garage right after this quick beer break. If you're looking for an easy way to ensure your children reach their full potential, IXL is the perfect learning program for you. IXL is the most comprehensive online learning program for K through 12, covering math, language arts, science, and social studies. On IXL, you'll find interactive practice problems, videos, lessons, and games organized by grade and subject. As your child uses the program, they'll get detailed explanations of new concepts, awards to celebrate hard work, and recommendations of topics to practice to close knowledge gaps or build on what they are learning. Memberships start at $9.95 a month, so it's much more affordable than a private tutor. And as a parent, you'll get meaningful reports on your child's progress. Studies nationwide have shown that students who use IXL are scoring higher on test. I've had several family members use, enjoy, and excel with the IXL learning experience. Some were trying to get ahead, some were trying to keep up with the class, and others were continuing their education and learning during the summer break. Plus, you'll save time and money over that of a traditional tutor. For a limited time, True Crime Garage listeners can get 20% off IXL membership. Visit IXL.com slash garage today. All right, we are back. Make sure you go to TrueCrimeGarage.com, sign up on the mailing list, and if you want to Join the Colonel at CrimeCon in Orlando. Make sure you use promo code TCG10 to get 10% off. Cheers, Captain. Cheers to everybody out there. Cheers to the people in the back. Now, let's. can we all agree here in the garage? I say that like there's 30 people here. It's, it's me and you currently. Oh, there's a, uh, there's a couple people in our pockets. If the police tell us that they have good reason to believe that there's foul play, can we can we move past the idea that maybe Rob just walked away from his life? Right. Okay. So let's take the police at their word. They're telling us that there's foul play. I believe there's foul play too. Even even if police weren't upfront about that, I look at this thing and say it's got foul play written all over it. Now, where is Rob? That's that's the whole thing here. I believe that the one thing that is holding charges back from being brought forward against an individual is the finding of Rob's remains. And the thing is, there's been a bunch of people over the years that have told police what happened to Rob. Unfortunately, they cannot confirm that without the evidence that would be his remains or the location of his remains. 
as to which theory or which story that's being presented to them is true. We've talked about this several times here in the garage. If you find Rob, what will happen? It will confirm one of those stories for police as being true. That will be the lead that they need. That will be the evidence they need to go out and charge somebody with this homicide. Now, the car, it was moved. Can we agree on that? Rob went somewhere. He went in the opposite direction of where the car was later found. Things happened very quickly here now, didn't they? Because we know that according to his air quotes girlfriend, Shirley, who he had maybe started dating just days before he goes missing, she says she called him around 8 o'clock. Neighbors see him leave around 9 p.m. Park rangers find his car abandoned in the parking lot less than five hours after he leaves his home. Things are moving very quickly. Something happened to Rob in that five hours, and it happened early enough that whoever's responsible for his disappearance was able to move his vehicle after the fact to that location. Yeah, I'm not sold on the idea that his car was moved. I, I, I would I would go with you on the idea that that's probably more likely what happened. Um, but what we do know for certainty is somebody wiped down that car. They altered that they altered that vehicle destroying evidence. So unless something unless Rob drove his car to that location, right. And somebody abducts him from there, which we do know is in the opposite direction of where he he was heading when he left his house. I don't think it matters what direction he was heading when he left his house. Then that car had to have been moved. The thing is, if that car was moved to me, I'm looking at, a, at minimum, a two-person operation here. Somebody to help the perpetrator, the murderer, whether after the fact or after witnessing or being a part of the murder of Rob Mooney. Moving that vehicle and then getting everybody back to where they need to be. Away from that vehicle. Now, we should point out here, remember, Shirley was in a relationship prior to with the man who ran Rob off of the road. We're calling him Andy. We're, we're not using his real name, even though he's... Real shitbag. Because he's not been charged in this crime. Shit he princess. has been convicted of other crimes, but right. we're not going to use his real name here because he's not been charged in this crime. So right. we'll just call him Andy for short. Andy's parents live on Central College Road, the same road that Rob lives on, not far from Rob's home in the direction that Rob was leaving that evening. Remember, all signs point to Rob believing or, or his actions suggesting that he believes he would be returning rather quickly back to his home and possibly back to his meal that night. By her own admission, Shirley says that she's on the phone with Rob at 8 p.m. Is there any chance that Shirley's call is the one that led Rob to leaving his home? And then we have people telling True Crime Garage that they were well aware that when Andy and Shirley were in a relationship together, that there was violence in that relationship. Could a threat against Shirley inspire Rob to leave and maybe go confront this individual who had run him off the road? Right. Or was he meeting, did he think he was meeting Shirley and running to her defense because she was at this man's residence. There's a lot of stuff going on there. And I feel like we were just one, maybe two pieces away from solving this puzzle. And like we've said over and over the, where his vehicle is found is minutes from his house. And if it's, and like you said, if there's evidence that leans towards the idea that the car was moved, Again, whether or not we agree on that doesn't matter because we do have somebody is messing, tampering with the car. And so is it out of the realms of possibility of we now have Rob, we wipe down his car, we toss him in the water, and we go about our way. Yeah, the thing, the thing that's telling to me too is even though police are tight-lipped, the question that I gave to the detective was, 
do you believe that it had to have been more than one person to move his vehicle and put it at that location where it was found? And the detective said the vehicle could have been moved by one person or two. The key part of that answer to me is it sounds like police are of the belief too, that the vehicle was moved and placed there. Yeah. But the reason why they're saying one is because if the, our prime suspect is this Andy guy, his parents live on the same road. No, 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 no. I get that. What I'm you saying I mean? is that it, the, the question that there's an answer within the non-answer of that question. Mm-hmm. The answer is that they believe that the vehicle was moved by one, two, 20, 30 people. They're not saying maybe they don't know how many people moved the vehicle, but they are of the belief working on the theory that it was in fact moved. Now let's hone back in on something that was stated in that article by Shirley who says I was at Hammerjack's bar on 161 about a week after Rob went missing. I ran into another man who ran around with Rob and his crowd. And this man says to me, your boy is six feet under quote. Your boy is six feet under police say they interview that man. And that man says, I never said that. Well, guess what? (laughs) One of them is lying. Either he said that and Shirley's being honest with police or Shirley is lying to police and trying to implicate somebody else having knowledge of what happened to Rob. Well, why would she do that? She probably wants to take herself out of the equation of being involved in whatever happened to Rob. If in fact she was the one lying, this case is difficult because I've been told by a few different sources, Captain, that it possibly could be linked to another homicide. And this is a Columbus homicide that took place a few years after Rob disappeared. So in Rob's case, law enforcement has a lot of reasons to believe that this is a foul play. Maybe charges would be brought if they could find Rob's remains. But some people have speculated that Rob's disappearance could be connected to another local homicide. Yes, and this comes from, as you said, Captain, Crime Stoppers who were looking for tips, offering up a reward for information leading to an arrest in a separate, completely separate homicide. In the in the Crime Stoppers request says, man shot and burned beyond recognition. A man was shot and killed, his body burned beyond recognition. It's a murder case that Columbus police have been trying to solve for more than a year. And we have a quote from the victim's mother, Dolores Donahue, who says, quote, I want these people off of the street. She wants to see justice for the people who killed her son, the victim of a gruesome murder that took place in January of 2002. The last time her son, Troy Donahue, was seen alive, he was hanging out with some friends at a pool hall in North Columbus. You're going to recognize a name that we just spoke about previously. Troy left the billiards club around 11 o'clock. Now, keep in mind, though, This is six years after Rob disappeared, five and a half years exactly after Rob disappeared. Troy told his brother and friends he was going to the parking lot and would be gone only a few minutes. As minutes turned to hours, Dolores remembers watching news reports of a body found near Freeway Drive. It turned out to be her son. He had been shot three times and his body set on fire burned so badly a delivery man thought that it was a pile of trash quote i will never understand why he had to be hurt so bad because he would give anything to anybody and what's likely to be more than just a coincidence someone also broke into troy's apartment that same night the night that he disappeared right so this article more than a year later columbus police saying we need the public's help We do not want some other mother to have to sit by and get hurt as bad and a family hurt as bad as this one has. So they offer up a a reward. Now, let's cut the story short here in this Troy Donahue murder, okay? It was no coincidence that his apartment was broken into that night. 
his apartment's broken into, there's money stolen from the apartment, and they find blood in the apartment. Now, I'm not certain. I've sorted through this, Captain. I can't figure out exactly where the blood came from, if it was Troy's blood. It sounds to me that this is what happened. Because we know, based off of eyewitness statements from the billiard club that night, that he said, oh, a car pulls up into the parking lot. A vehicle pulls up into the parking lot. I believe it was a van. And he goes, oh, I got to go out there and talk to these people. I'll be right back. Right. He goes out, doesn't ever come back into the bar. I'm guessing that those people abducted Troy Donahue, took him to his apartment, and either used him to gain access the, the, or or threatened him while they gained access to his apartment. They were looking for something in that apartment. Money, drugs, maybe even weapons. And we know that the apartment was all busted up, and at the end of the night, Troy Donahue is killed and set on fire. Now, he was killed. It was ruled by the coroner that he was set on fire after he died. He, he was already dead by the time that happened. Um, eventually they catch up to all these people. So the vehicle that these people were out stealing a bunch of vehicles that night too. There were three of them and they arrested them and charged them with the stolen vehicles and charged them with breaking into Troy Donahue's apartment. It would take several years for these people to turn on each other. But eventually what we end up with, Captain, is all of those people involved start spilling the beans. And then we end up with three people being arrested and charged in some form or fashion with either Donahue's murder or with abuse of a corpse. How does this story have anything to do with Rob's disappearance? Rob and Troy knew each other a little bit. Okay. From my understanding, the way it's explained to me is that Rob ran with some of the people that ran with Troy and Troy ran with some of the people that ran with Rob, but the two never really ran together. Right. Does it make sense? A person that knew both of them says that they went to Troy's and I'm having difficulty recalling this because we have grandparents and parents that are named throughout this story by different sources. It was either Troy's parents home or grandparents home. This person is close with Troy goes to Troy's parents home or grandparents home. Troy's to with the purpose of meeting Troy. This meeting takes place in July of 1996 same month that Rob goes missing. This source says Troy was out in the backyard doing yard work. When this person talks to Troy, Troy is sweating. He's all dirty. He looks like he's been digging in the backyard. And the person says, you know, what's going on? You look tired. You look all beat up. You look, you look, you're sweaty. What's going on? I was just out in the backyard digging and doing some work. Nobody really, this person doesn't think much of this at that time. This person then sees Troy again at another time. They're at a different location. This person has told us that Troy pulls this person aside and says, if anything ever happens to me, remember, just remember that there's something buried in my, in that backyard. If anything happens to me, remember there's something buried in that backyard. Now, to be perfectly clear, to be perfectly clear, this this homicide, poor Troy Donahue who was killed, may have nothing to do with Rob's case at all. What's buried in that backyard, what was Troy telling to, trying to tell this person, may have nothing to do with Rob's case. It could be money in that back, backyard. It could be drugs. It could be weapons. Who knows what it could be? But it's a circle that might be connected it's to the, another circle. It's exactly. It's the circle, and it's this person saying, I've always said that somebody needs to dig up that backyard because of the timing of everything. He's out there digging in the yard. 
not terribly long after Rob disappears. And by the way, whatever he's digging or why ever he's digging in that row in that yard at a later time tells the same person, if anything ever happens to me, remember that there's something buried in that backyard. And what, unfortunately we know something terrible ends up happening to this young man. So, This is one of those things, Captain. Again, I believe whoever is responsible for Rob going missing probably had some kind of help, whether that help was killing Rob, making him disappear, whether that help was moving the vehicle, whether that help was burying the body. I believe that he had some help, and I believe that there are probably... I hesitate to to give a, a definitive answer here, but after speaking to all the people that I could get in touch with that ha- that have insider knowledge of this case and the people that we've discussed in this story, that there's probably about we're probably down to about four places that they should be looking for Rob. And again, I can't speak for Westerville Police Department, but I can I can speculate. Right. And you've seen this a hundred times. I've seen it a hundred times. I believe they are one body away from charging somebody. And we do know that at some point they had a prime suspect and that prime suspect was a male. Yeah, and you would think that maybe that would at least be able to search that property with cadaver dogs. From what I've been told by multiple people, the four locations that, that I'm not going to talk about here today in the garage that we are choosing not to announced to the public these locations and for good reason. But what we've been told is that these locations have been discussed recently with police. Right. It's in their power. If, if they're able to do something with this information, they might be doing something with it relatively soon. Frustration is, is, is probably the key word in these cases, but let's not be fooled we've talked to so many people in law enforcement and when they believe they know who is responsible for somebody's murder, they want to get the bad guy just as, as much, if not more than anybody else. Well, and here's the thing you look for the, the weak link, right? You are the weakest link. You look for that because what do we have here? Captain, if, as stated by law enforcement, they have a prime suspect in this case. We can't say for certain that it's the person that we're calling Andy, but according to everybody we've talked to, all roads lead to this person that we're calling Andy. And then I think the way to go about this, you're talking over 20 years later and no solution to this homicide case You've not been able to crack this person, whether he failed that lie detector, inconclusive, whatever you want to call it, test that he took years ago. You've not been able to build a great case against him. So what do you do? I believe based off of the vehicle, its location, where it was found in the events of the night that Rob went missing and off of statements that have been relayed to us, the prime suspect had help whether it was in the murder, the concealment of the body or the moving of the vehicle or the destruction of evidence, the, the murderer had help. The prime suspect is probably the murderer and had help. So you look for the weak link. You look for the person or persons that helped the prime suspect and see if you could get them to crack or see if you can find or build a case against one of them. So who could have helped the prime suspect. Well, we already mentioned the individual that we're calling Shirley, who says that they called Rob that night. Is that why Rob left? Did this person we're calling Shirley come up with a story to convince Rob to leave that night, to go to a place, to put himself into danger and he, where he got ambushed? We also have that person, that same person that we're calling Shirley that says, I talked to some guy, bumped into another man like a week later, and he said, your boy is six feet under. Police say we talked to him. He said, I did not say that. One of those two is lying. Right. If it's Shirley, it's not too hard to believe that she's lying about a whole bunch of other stuff in this case. 
Oh, let's point out another weird thing here. The people that were calling Shirley and Andy, years after Rob is gone, they move in and rent that house. Well, that's a little strange now, isn't it? That's a little weird. They rent the same house that Rob was living in. That Rob once rented and lived in himself. The the home he was living in when he disappeared. Mm. And then, so who who was involved? That's where we want to go with this. Now, we talked about Troy Donahue, who who had said that weird statement to a person that, that knew both Rob and knew Troy. If anything ever happens to me, remember there's something buried in that backyard. Could it be Rob? It might be. We don't know. Right. It, it, it very likely is not, but it could be. Again, if the prime suspect had help, could Troy Donahue have been a helper? Uh, then we've had a couple people tell us that there were two strange guys that they believe were from Columbus or the Columbus area that were hanging out at Rob and Ron's house the weekend prior to Rob going missing. Could they have helped our prime suspect? Oh, and let's take that a step further. Could one of them have been Troy Donahue, who was from Columbus? We've had another source that told us that two very evil men suspected of other evil deeds from Nelsonville may have been involved. And while we will not disclose the locations, the exact locations of those four properties that one should call in a question and that, that I believe and would hope that someday they can be searched. One of those properties is obviously that property that Troy Donahue referenced. If anything ever happens to me, remember there's something buried in that, that backyard. The other property should be down the street from where Rob lived. The direction he was driving that night is in the direction of the person we're calling Andy of his, his parents home where Andy was residing at the time that Rob disappeared. Could something be there? Could Rob be there on that property? Uh, these bad guys from Nelsonville, there's a property and we, we know the address. There's a property in Nelsonville that might have something there worth looking for. And then another location that, that, that we can't, that we won't give a description of here, but this is one of those cases, captain, that's so damn frustrating because there's, it feels like there's, it's described as this very mysterious case of this man just disappears one night and his car is found by the water. Well, you start peeling back the layers and you see that there are some very plausible theories here. There's some very suspicious looking individuals involved in this story. And then you start digging and you go, maybe there's some low hanging fruit here, but here we sit all these years later without answers as to whatever happened to Rob Money. But also with a lot of local rumors and, and speculation and and people saying, well, there there could be a body in this backyard. Well, they've had plenty of time to move it. Law enforcement says, oh, well, we don't believe that his body was in the water. Well, you could move the body and put it in the water. So there might have been answers that they could have found out one time at one time, but that doesn't mean that people haven't um, tampered with the evidence even more since being questioned and hearing these rumors coming from law enforcement. And like you said, there's still a lot of holdback information, but we believe that law enforcement thinks if they could find a body that they could bring charges to these individuals. So please, please, please remember Rob Money. Rob, 29 years old, who was ambushed, killed, and body concealed since 1996. If you have any information regarding the murder of Rob Money, or if you can provide a lead or a tip so that his body can be found and recovered, please call Westerville Police Detective Grubbs at 614-901-6888. Eight, one. If you are not comfortable speaking with law enforcement, you can 
go to our website, truecrimegarage.com. Please, if anybody has information, please pass it along. And the Westerville police phone number will be listed in this week's show notes. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us here in the garage. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading? This week, Captain, we are recommending Tantamount, The Pursuit of the Freeway Phantom Serial Killer by Blaine Pardo and Victoria Hester. I've got to say these two are probably the best in true crime writing today. I am blown away by their books. They're amazing. Their research is second to none. Tantamount is about the freeway phantom who was stalking the streets of our nation's capital back in 1971 and 1972. Still an unsolved case about a deadly predator who's stalking the streets and leaving the remains of his victims along busy roadways in plain view. Some of the victims were held captive for several days. If you enjoy reading, if you enjoy true crime, If you enjoy Audible, you'll want to make sure that you check out Tantamount, The Pursuit of the Freeway Phantom Serial Killer by the great Blaine Pardo and Victoria Hester. You can find that title and many other wonderful recommendations on our recommended page, truecrimegarage.com. And until next week, be good, be kind, and don't litter.